my name is uh, Thierry Carrez. Um, I work for the OpenStack Foundation. I've been involved with uh, open source communities for the last 15 years, so not 20, only 15. Um, started with the uh, Gen2 Linux in at the turn of the century, uh, then uh, got hired by Canonical to work on their Ubuntu server product as a technical lead. And since 2010, um, working on the OpenStack. And today I want to talk to you about what's the topic of this, this conference, which is uh, the new challenges for mainstream open source software, uh, with an eye on market readiness in particular. And uh, to do that, we need to explore uh, like what is OpenStack and how mainstream is it, and then, and then uh, talk about the various challenges. So first, what is OpenStack? Um, for first and foremost, OpenStack is uh, a community. It's a community with shared principles, a shared mission, and shared events so that we can all get together. Um, the shared principles are called the four opens. They are mainly called, I mean, they are guiding principles that derive from it, but the key is the four, four opens. So open source, which means that all the software that is produced uh, within OpenStack is uh, open source and uh, licensed under the Apache 2 license. Um, it's also uh, a stating that we don't do any open core and we, we don't like have any enterprise edition of anything. Uh, and uh, all, the, all the features that are produced by the OpenStack community is, is uh, published as open source. Uh, it also goes beyond that. We, we try to ensure that all the projects are um, open collaboration with a level playing field. So we, we reject projects that would give any company an unfair advantage or any organization involved an unfair advantage. Um, so for example, we don't accept drivers for proprietary hardware uh, that would uh, uh, give the contributors from that specific organization some advantage over over uh, over everyone else. Uh, we do open development. That's mostly about transparency. So you you can see any change that is being proposed. You can participate in the code review. Uh, you can attend any of the meetings. Uh, you can uh, consult the logs of any meeting. You can you can see all the mailing lists. There is no secret mailing list. There is no private meeting. Everything is happening in the open. We also do open design, which means that it's not a separate group of developers that are uh, conferring uh, in the darkness to, to drive the future of OpenStack. It's actually happening in our events. Anyone can join and you can, you can participate uh, to uh, discussing where OpenStack should go next. Um, and finally, it's open community. That means that anyone in the community, any contributor can step up and become a leader in OpenStack. You don't have to be like a member of the OpenStack Foundation or anything. Um, we value contribution as our only currency. And that means like every contributor gets one vote in our technical elections. So you get, um, you can elect uh, your, uh, the, all the leadership is elected. The technical committee is all elected, but also the technical uh, uh, project leads of each project is elected by the contributors to that project. And that means that anyone can grow and become a leader in our, in our community. Our shared mission is to produce an ubiquitous open source cloud computing platform that is easy to use, simple to implement, interoperable between deployments, works well at all scales, meets the needs of users and operators of public and private clouds. So that uh, mouthful, to, it's a pretty wide mission, but it's centered around providing infrastructure resources. So it's not really something you would deploy in your garage to, um, you know, on a Sunday. Uh, it's more if you happen to own a data center or a bunch of servers, you might find this interesting. Um, the, this mission attracted a large number of people and, and organizations. We have uh, 3,200 developers contributing to OpenStack over the last year. So it's not like a cumulative member, number like most of open source communities like to, to expand. They're actually active developers that contributed over the past year to uh, one of the OpenStack projects. They are coming from 300 different organizations, not all of them being members of the OpenStack Foundation, obviously, uh, and, uh, but that's where the developers come from and from all, other, all around the globe. And they're producing 90,000 commits per year over the last year, uh, which makes OpenStack one of the most active open source communities out there. Um, we're also a very test-centric organization. So, um, to produce those 90,000 commits, we, we end up triggering 23,000 tests every day, 
most of them taking one hour to run, deploying a full OpenStack cloud over multiple VMs, and that runs about on over 2,000 cloud instances generously donated by our infrastructure sponsors. And that's, um, that's key to OpenStack, is the software is quite complex, so we rely a lot on automated testing to cover most of the, most of the uh, regression testing in particular, and so um, we rely on those cloud instances uh, to, to prove that the software is still working after a change. So what is it we produce? Um, I mentioned in software for infrastructure. We say open infrastructure. The idea is to uh, give infrastructure provider a solution to deploy on top of their computing resources so that they can offer resources to application developers and application operators. And that means options. You want to give them VMs, obviously, but also bare metal machines at demand or, or containers or containers orchestration engine like Kubernetes. Um, you want to provide all those computing options with shared networking and storage. You want to give uh, the ability for uh, application deployers to uh, be able to use a VM next to a container and have them uh, share networking and storage so that you can use the right technology for the right job. Um, you want uh, advanced services like object storage or a database as a service so that application developers can, um, can access those uh, powerful primitives in their programming. Uh, you want multi-tenancy so that you account for every usage of, of um, and you properly isolate the various users of your of your resources. Um, you want interoperability so that you are not locked in with a given provider and you can switch to a next one that also happens to use OpenStack. Um, you also want bursting this ability to uh, use uh, those extra resources in a private in a public cloud that happens to run OpenStack. Uh, and uh, for that extra capacity for the few days of the year, you actually need that extra capacity. Um, and finally, you want support for whatever comes next. You want the software, the framework you deploy to be also there tomorrow when the next wave of infrastructure tooling comes. So you don't want to be stuck with what you have. You want a framework that will evolve with technology uh, and will support whatever comes next. The needs of your software developers and uh, application operators of today, but also the needs they will have tomorrow. So is it mainstream? Um, that's the number of uh, CPU cores that actually are running uh, uh, OpenStack on top of them. Um, so that's 5 million CPU cores in production over 80 countries. Uh, that's only the ones we know about because we tend to, uh, like with all open source software, it's quite difficult to know exactly who is actually using it. Um, so we run a user survey every six months, we, we send it out there, we have replies, and that's based on those replies. We have uh, 5 million CPU cores on that user survey in, in 80 countries, but we are still discover, discovering new ones every day. Like uh, two weeks ago, I discovered that Orange, we are here at Orange Gardens, I discovered that Orange uh, is running um, Orange Mail on top of an OpenStack platform. So that's new, and you know that, that's cool. 50% um, of uh, the Fortune 100 are using OpenStack one way or another. That's the la 100 largest companies in the world. And um, two thirds of the deployments are actually in production. So it's not at this experimental stage. It's really more about uh, uh, production use cases. Uh, we are still growing. Uh, we measured a 44% increase year over year in the number of deployments as reported by that user survey. Um, so that's, that means more users, but also more users that are willing to uh, express that they are using OpenStack, because we can't really differentiate who, uh, who actually uh, reports for the first time or who just joined over the last year. And that's not just a small deployment. I have a few, um, few examples. AT&T is running OpenStack in, in nearly 100 data centers globally, which uh, based on that user alone makes it a very uh, widely deployed software for operating clouds. Um, Walmart, which is the largest company in the world, is running e-commerce on top of OpenStack. Uh, they're, using, they're doing like the, the Cyber Monday type sales uh, on top of an OpenStack platform that runs 170,000 CPU cores of computing power. Uh, OVH, closer to France, OVH is running uh, an OpenStack public cloud with hundreds of thousands of VMs uh, in six different geographic regions. And they're growing a lot. They're like deploying new data centers um, every 
semester now. Um, China, we have lots of users in China, and it's always difficult to get them to talk, but everything in China is just big. Um, like China Mobile is an OpenStack user, and they have 835 eight uh, million subscribers, which is like, it's too big to be kept in your head. Um, and finally, CERN, CERN uh, computing, is running on top of an OpenStack cloud. They are using their OpenStack cloud for about 90% of their computing needs. And their, their OpenStack cloud there is uh, running on two data centers for over 250,000 CPU cores and 600 terabytes of RAM capacity, which is kind of, kind of, a, kind of a nice computer there. So by the number of definition of mainstream, OpenStack is mainstream, it's pretty well known now. Uh, it's it's adopted. We have users, uh, but at the same time, it also has the the bad sides of mainstream. Like it's become boring because because people realize it's actually just infrastructure software. It's not like um, will not sell solve world hunger or uh, cure cancer, and so they realize that infrastructure software can be boring, which uh, means they might not be interested in it anymore. Uh, it's not a gold mine either. Uh, like. Sometimes when a new technology comes, people just throw money at it because they expect it to return tenfold. And at some point, they realize that there is not that much money to be made out of that specific technology. And, and we're at that, that specific spot right now with OpenStack. So what are our challenges? Um, I'll mainly talk about the challenges that we encounter as a community because that's my side of things, but we'll also uh, Keep an eye on on the on how do we ensure the market readiness, which is more more the topic of this uh, this conference. Um, our first challenge is around identity. Uh, when you have that many developers, um, you attract that many organizations. It's really difficult to keep a sense of what you are exactly. So the question, what is OpenStack, is actually harder to uh, to answer than you than you would think. Uh, the first tension is around between community and product. OpenStack started as a product. It was like very specifically uh, for a specific use case, which was like mostly automating VMs, uh, VM provisioning. Um, but as as technology evolved, uh, it proved to be this product-centric approach proved to be very limiting, very excluding. Um, we had lots of people wanting to work on on other areas that are. Near um, near the use case of the main use case of OpenStack, and um, we could they, they were not OpenStack. They were part of the OpenStack community, but the software they produced was not OpenStack. So at some point uh, in 2014, we were pretty stuck with what we had, and we decided to um, pivot to a more community-centric definition. If you follow our principles, if you are helping with the OpenStack mission, well, then you're part of OpenStack. You are the OpenStack community. So what you're producing uh, is probably part of the OpenStack framework. And that brings us to the next uh, tension, which is between product, product and framework. Like I said, um, it started really early on as, as a very uh, product-centric approach. But if, if you um, are you there to solve a specific problem or are you there to solve a problem space, and um, that's another tension that has been there since the beginning of OpenStack. Is is it like a collection of projects? Is it more of a pr framework? And the, the answer was actually in the in the previous question, which is if we are a community, we're after we're solving a set of problems. We're sol solving a a, a, a a problem which is providing open infrastructure to um, to everyone else, and. So it's not a specific product. It's more like a framework that will evolve over time to match the needs for, of that specific question. Um, the next tension of our identity is between design and open collaboration, um, which is an interesting one. I've been thinking a bit more about it recently. Um, if, I mean, uh, if you are a very opinionated a group of people, you can really uh, race toward a very specific outcome. You can you can have this minimal product. You can just do, deliver the features that are needed for that. Um, but in the case of an open collaboration, it's really difficult to have that kind of a very uh, a laser focused 
uh, um, work on 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 how do, how you you look at features and OpenStack got a lot of heat about not being opinionated enough or going in every direction but it's actually a property of how we develop things and I would argue that open collaboration if you want to do open collaboration you have to be accepting of of those various features and various use cases you have to accept that it will take you a longer road to get where you need to be because um, but that's the only way to do it together. And that why I like this, this uh, African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, you can go alone. But if you really want to go far and be there 10 years from now, well, you need to go together. That means it will probably take longer to get there. But um, actually, you will have, in the end, something that everyone is happy with rather than uh, a dying startup. Um, finally, we need to recognize the need to engage beyond. Um, it's, it's really difficult when you're... Uh, when you're a, a successful open source project, to um, not want to do everything uh, in house, like you, it, it's tempting when you have all those resources, all those developers, to just say, "Well, we can reinvent everything." But, um, like Simon said, we need to. We have with open source the ability to build on top of everyone else, and. Let's face it, you cannot be experts in everything. So you should not be in the business of writing databases if someone else writes perfectly functional databases, so just reuse them. Um, and so that need to really recognize that there is a beyond and the need to engage with it rather than try to do everything in-house is really, is really important. Um, we need to uh, recognize that there are other pieces, technology pieces in other uh, organizations that are valuable for us. And at the same time, we need to package our stuff so that it's reusable by others. We need to make sure that our own software is also something that can be reused separately without deploying like only OpenStack components in every direction. We need to share experiences. We need to, there aren't so many projects that have done open collaboration at the scale we've been doing it, and there are more coming. There, there are new, new communities forming. We need to uh, learn from how they, they approach the problem. They need to learn from us the things we did well, the things we did wrong. And so this need to engage with, with uh, and share those experiences is also our way to, to give back to, uh, to the rest of the open source community. Okay, the second family of challenges is around feature creep, and we touched uh, a bit on it earlier. Um, if you uh, add a lot of features, it's really difficult to say no to someone that comes to your community and says, well, I, can, I have this patch that will add this feature that will make it really awesome for this use case. It's really difficult to say no. The problem is features add up. And at some point, the problem is you reach a level of complexity that is unbearable. And OpenStack has been, is, is basically there. We, it's really difficult to, um, to uh, um, uh, tackle the complexity of the software. Um, so how do you address that complexity? How do you fix that um, and still be an open collaboration? Um, my advice for, for, uh, for projects that are at that stage is to adopt more of an expand and contract model. That is, initially you accept the features, you let a thousand flower bl flowers bloom, but you need to be uh, uh, aware of the need to take that step back, look at the complexity, look at options and, and configuration options or features, see what's unused, see what's useless, see the projects that are not going anywhere, and cut them. And that's some, it's a very difficult discussion to have in an open community, um, but that's really a necessary discussion we need to have. And we're uh, precisely at that stage right now with OpenStack. We need to address that complexity head on, even if it's not natural for an open collaboration to just say, well, you were part of our community, but your project's not going anywhere. So it's probably better if, if you're not part of OpenStack anymore and you just continue your project somewhere. Um, it's difficult discussions, but it's necessary. Otherwise, you just add up complexity until it's just not sustainable. Uh, the third challenge is long-term sustainability. You built a community with 3,000 developers. How do you uh, survive over the long run? Um, the first uh, need is to grow new leaders. It's, um, it's, it's um, the, the, this need to, to have new leadership coming up um, because like organizations, uh, companies get bought or, or they, they disappear, people move on um, and you need to have 
uh, the leadership yeah. to have sufficient uh, uh, rotation in there to 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 have um, to have someone else take over. And uh, the way we do that in OpenStack is to try to uh, ensure good succession planning, make sure that uh, the leaders are not attached to their position. So we do a lot of uh, um, servant leadership model, which is uh, uh, basically leaders are serving their constituency, or stewards are, are, are serving their constituencies. And um, that is pretty essential for making sure that people realize that it's more duties than it is rights. Leaders in, in the open source world are mostly about duties and not really uh, about power because they don't really have any. Uh, and so once people realize that they are more than willing to just um, you know, train the next, uh, the next sucker that will take their role and, <laughs> and work day and night for the project. Um, we also need to recognize the, the fact that our contributors base evolve. Um, OpenStack started with just the founders, so NASA and Rackspace. Um, then really quickly we had startups showing up and that created a quite a, a bad culture because uh, it's, it wasn't a great culture fit. Like startups and, and open collaboration projects don't really fit well together because they have those uh, short-term goals, they have the need to differentiate that doesn't blend well with the rest of the, of the, of the contributors. But then qu really quickly we had large service providers coming like IBM, Red Hat, HP, um, and those are great because they just throw a lot of, res uh, and they have lots of resources, they just throw dozens of developers to your project and they're, um, they're tackling tasks that are uh, important for open source projects that are not necessarily obvious. And finally, uh, but at some point large service companies, they just readjust their investment. They, they just realize they're just that not money to be made out of the project. And so they look at the return on investment and they readjust the number of, of people they're sending to the project. So you go from hundreds of developers to dozens of developers from those, those organizations. At that point, if you don't have the users to take over, you're, a bit, uh, you're in a bit of a pain. Um, so OpenStack, we have lots of users, that's great. We just need to make sure we capture them. We engage with them upstream. It's really difficult because we built a community around people that can spend most of their time, uh, work time on, on, on the project. And we are switching with people that work for companies that are deploying OpenStack. And those, um, that means it's maybe 10%, 20%, 50% of their job, not more. And our processes need to evolve to accommodate those, um, those contributors. Uh, in the same vein, we need to embrace Asia. I mentioned China earlier. Uh, we have lots of users from China. Uh, how do we turn them into contributors? And, and that's a challenge that like, we don't really have a, any example of a successful open source community that has successfully embraced China. Um, how do we do that? All the processes we have, all the, de the two decades, the three decades of uh, of uh, the two decades of open source we have behind us is around well IRC meetings, weekly meetings, uh, and and uh, English as a as a as a communication medium. Uh, that doesn't work so well with with Chinese people. If you have your weekly meeting at a time that is convenient for Europe and and, and the US, it's probably 5 p.m. 6 p.m. our time. And it's like 4 a.m. in China, and so there's just no way you can have a sync meeting that will be including everyone. If you just set separate meetings, you just don't have everyone showing up. So it, it doesn't serve the purpose of the meeting. How do you reinvent open source development in a way that embraces those users in China? Because China is really opening to open source. We need to be able to grab that. We need to be uh, able to, to tap on that potential. Otherwise, we'll be just missing. Um, tragedy of the Commons. We've that's a common one. Uh, it's a well-known one. Um, how do you get people to work on the stuff that benefits everyone else? Um, there are tactical contributions like a patch that only benefits your use case or fixes a bug that only you, new encounters or delivers a feature that is only useful for, for you in particular. And there is strategic work like fixing a bug that affects everyone, working on release management, on QA, on uh, stable branch maintenance. How do you uh, get people to commit to do the things that are useful for everyone? Uh, it's, it's not easy. Uh, I would say that the good 
side of having large service companies like IBM or Red Hat involved is that they, they are used to that. They know that it's necessary for the survival of an open source project. So they're throwing resources at you and asking you, well, uh, where can I help? Like I, I remember in 2013, people from IBM and Red Hat coming and basically ask me, well, where can I make a difference? Where, where can I help? Where can I really help this community strive over the, over the long run? And that was extremely helpful because we, we had all those, all those people filling those really needed spots. But that as they are reevaluating uh, re their investment, we are losing those key people now. How do we replace them? And that's, not, that's, uh, that's a problem we need to, we need to address. And the, the way we are trying to address it is by being a bit more explicit about it. Uh, you can't really assume that they will know exactly where uh, the, the project needs the most resources or, or where contribution really helps versus then compared to hurting the project. And so we've been, we've been trying to be very, very much explicit about what it is that makes a good strategic contribution, where can you make a difference. That's very useful for contributors from China, actually, because they, otherwise they just like contribute patches. They think that the currency is the number of commits or the number of reviews that they do, and they just contribute typo patches that just clog your uh, CI and not, not help. So you need to be explicit and say, well, you know, documentation is actually the thing we need to we need to work on or or this project is struggling please invest resources in it and then you have to give them proper recognition for doing it which is another uh, difficult topic okay last but not least market readiness um, how do you get a project that is really um, matches the needs of your users and and one, one of the recipes is to, is to be open to new use cases. It's easy to say, but in an open collaboration, uh, the software will go in the direction of the contributions. So if you contribute code, the, that probably will go through that use case, only if you let it happen, because sometimes the contribution is coming from a completely different corner and it's really difficult to accept. Um, so for example, in OpenStack, we have lots of interest from uh, uh, big telcos, um, so AT&T, Verizon, Orange, and others. And uh, people that are coming with that background, uh, it's a completely different background from the open source world, that they're using acronyms everywhere, they love standards body, and we had it, we had them. Uh, uh, they, they have all those ways of doing things that are more in secret committees, and you, you need to, there is a culture clash between the needs of the, the way telcos usually operate with the way open source communities usually operate. But we need to break that wall because uh, we need that use case to be filled. We need to be uh, able to use OpenStack in, in, uh, in big telcos environments. Um, we need to be accepting their features even if they are not really uh, 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 useful for public cloud providers or for other use cases. Uh, the next one is to close the loop. Uh, how do you uh, make sure that the pain points of operators are fed back into development and, and prioritized up in the in the day-to-day -day work of the developers? Um, we're quite happy in OpenStack because we managed to, st to have a very engaged operators community. We really uh, managed to have operators, they have their own events, they, they get together, they share a lot of, of operational experience, which is really, really awesome. But at the same time, we built that community with, um, by giving it a sense of identity. It was operators, let's, let's band together against the developers. And so there were separate events, there were uh, separate groups of people, separate governance, how do we put them back in the same rooms? How do we get developers to talk to operators and operators uh, to talk to developers? And so we've been, we've been working actively um, to, separate, to remove that separation. Like we don't have our design summits, we don't call them design summits anymore we don't, because that was too developer oriented. Uh, there were ops days, we don't do ops days anymore. We changed that. So the, this place where we are actually discussing the requirements for the next release is now called the forum and everyone can come. Um, and we, we have other, other initiatives to try to uh, break that wall between operators and developers uh, by putting them in the same work groups, trying to uh, 
erase the difference in, in, uh, in governance between the two. Facilitating market feedback. We have lots of people that are looking at the market. Um, we have the user survey I mentioned. We have uh, we actually managed to also build a community around marketing people within the various organizations that are involved in OpenStack. So the various people that do marketing in those organizations get together and collaborate openly uh, to to like try to craft the the marketing language around OpenStack. Um, but developers are extremely dismissive of that kind of contribution. <laughs> so we need to. Uh, uh, be accepting that, that feedback that they are giving us. Um, they, we have product managers that are trying to um, build a roadmap for OpenStack, which is like, we don't, I don't even know where it's going. How do they know? Well, they are trying to they interview developers, they are trying to get long-term uh, ideas of where they're heading, and they're producing a, a roadmap. We need to embrace that feedback and make sure we prioritize it, because that's the way to stay relevant in the, in the for, like adapted to the user's need in the future. And finally, we need to be able to take a step back. Um, sometimes the way you structure your projects bleeds into implementation. Um, so OpenStack is lots of different projects, uh, but you have to combine multiple uh, of them to, to actually deliver uh, um, a functionality. So by having those developers working in a specific silo, you end up not having that um, it's not use case oriented. It's, it's like technical, it's focused on a specific uh, technical piece. So you need to allow them to take that step back, look at the use case, look at the various projects that are involved, look at the user experience, and work between the projects to smoothen the, um, to smooth the experience there. Um, so don't let the project structure uh, uh, ruin the developer experience. So that's about all the, all the things, all the challenges that I wanted to mention uh, right now, it's just a glimpse. Obviously, we have a, a, a panel uh, at 2 p.m., I think, where we'll, we'll talk about more of those uh, challenges for mainstream open source. I hope that was useful. Thank you.